My name is Guy Daniels, and I am the microbiome expert. Welcome to another informative presentation on the microbiome. My goal here is to give a general introductory presentation, while at the same time providing new information for those more savvy on the topic of the microbiome. Here, I try to give you some perspective on what the microbiome is and how it plays a role in your health. For some, the topic may be completely new. For others, it's the latest fad. And for the rest, it's something you've been aware of for some time and you want to learn more. Once you've completed this webinar, I have plenty of others for you to move on to where you'll see information and perspective you'll find nowhere else. So what is this thing called the microbiome? A simple question, but not easy to answer. When people ask me what I do for a living, I have struggled to explain it and so my short answer usually is, it's like probiotics, but much more complicated. I use this analogy because most people have heard of probiotics, which by the way, I never recommend. For more on that, see my webinar entitled, Probiotics, Don't Waste Your Time or Your Money. When we use the term microbiome, we're usually referring to the microbiome of the distal ileum in the colon. However, you should be aware that every part of you contains a microbiome, on the skin, in the mouth, the lungs, the vagina, everywhere and the microbiome can change dramatically as we can see here in this slide. And it is composed of a number of players. The biggest determinant are the bacteria, but you also have other microbes such as fungi, archaea, and so forth. But we will focus on the bacteria. Once you control them, you control the environment. The human gut microbiome is established at birth, ideally via a vaginal delivery and followed by exclusive breastfeeding. As shown here, water is the largest single component of breast milk, but among the solid components, the third largest is human milk oligosaccharides. It's even higher than protein. So what is a human milk oligosaccharide? They are sugars bonded together, which are non-digestible to us, but these sugars are fuel for the bacteria in the infant gut. And this fuel feeds primarily good bacteria, so they can thrive and create a favorable environment. So ask yourself, why would millions of years of evolution drive us to consume so much energy to produce this component, which only has nutritional value to the bacteria in our guts? The microbiome must have a great deal of importance, and it does. However, as we go through life, it takes a number of hits. The two largest determinants of the adult microbiome are diet and exposure to antibiotics. Each of us has a unique microbiome. The number of species of bacteria in our gut varies quite a bit. But for now, we'll just say that on average, it's about 1,500 different species. But we all don't have the same species and not in the same proportions. They will depend on your lifetime exposures and genes. To put just a fraction of the human gastrointestinal tract into perspective, the intestinal barrier, the surface area of the cells which line your intestines, has been estimated to be about one and a half doubles tennis courts. About 70% of your immune system is in and around your gut. The number of bacteria in your gastrointestinal tract varies from beginning to end, with the most being located in the colon. Estimates vary, but the count of bacteria in your colon number a bit less than your overall human cell count. But your total whole body bacterial microbiome outnumbers your own cell count. As far as DNA goes, it's estimated that the DNA content of your gut microbiome encodes 100 to 150 times more genes than does your own DNA. In other words, you have a large foreign ecosystem inside of you, interacting with plenty of surface area, which is immediately backed up by a possible robust immune response. Bottom line, you need to learn to live in harmony with your microbiome. I often get questions about international variability. Of course, there is some. There are always those bacteria which complete the taxological fingerprint for a person or region. However, and this is very important, the main bacterial players in the gut are the same from country to country. For example, the superstar of the gut, Fecalibacterium prausitzii, is a superstar in every country. The opportunistic pathogen, Ruminococcus navis, is a bad actor in every country. I know this slide is busy, but we're just going to follow the colors. Here we have data from 12 studies from around the world which publish the most abundant taxa in their respective healthy controls. The taxa in green are the health promoters I have identified over the years. As you can see, they are prominent in healthy controls and tend to congregate towards the top of the list. In other words, they are the most abundant, they take up the most real estate in the gut. The orange color represents taxa I've identified as disease promoting. As you can see, they are fewer in number and tend to be less abundant in healthy controls from around the world. The yellow represents taxa which came up only one time as a top taxon within all of these 12 studies. As you can see, in all of these international studies, 
Bacteroides was a top taxon in every study, usually at or near number one. So, the main players are relatively uniform around the globe. You just need to know how to manipulate them. And these players don't all have equal impacts on your health. For example, we'll take the genus Bacteroides, which we just saw in the previous slide. On average, it's the most abundant genus in healthy controls around the world. It's a very large genus with mixed data and happens to be a part of the gram-negative bacteria in your gut. Why do I bring that up? Because we'll discuss LPS, lipopolysaccharide, many times in my presentations. LPS is the major component of the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria. It's used to measure intestinal permeability and induces inflammation. Too much LPS is considered a bad thing. However, you have to put it into perspective. There are many gram-negative bacteria. E. coli, for example, is another. E. coli is a known opportunistic pathogen. It has been shown that the LPS from E. coli is 100 to 1,000 times more pro-inflammatory than that from Bacteroides. So your body can handle much higher levels of Bacteroides than E. coli. One bacteria can't handle high levels of is Clostridium, now Clostridioides, difficile. A relative abundance of only 0.017% of C. diff in a dysbiotic gut has been shown to cause what's called a C. diff infection, which is a misnomer, but you can learn more about that in the webinar dedicated to C. diff. C. difficile is the classic opportunistic pathogen. A C. diff infection is an acute event, but it's actually years in the making. It's the classic case of dysbiosis. So when we talk about the microbiome and its effects on your health, we're talking chronic issues. Oftentimes, patients feel that not only their gut symptoms, but all of their symptoms must be attributed to something particularly nasty. It must be some nefarious parasite. It must be some highly pathogenic bacteria. It must be some deadly virus. Although these are possibilities, the vast majority of the time, the cause is something called dysbiosis. Dysbiosis is when the balance of power in your microbiome has shifted from one that is health promoting to one that is driven by what are called opportunistic pathogens. When they are in charge, they begin and continue a process of inflammation which can have ramifications not only in your gut, but in every aspect of your health. You may find that statement hard to believe, but it's true. If you doubt me, watch my presentations. Dysbiosis can occur in the mouth as well. There are certain species associated with dental cavities and periodontitis. The bacteria in the mouth have been linked to atherosclerotic disease and dental disease has been associated with elevated risks of heart attacks. In this paper, the bacterial DNA found in atherosclerotic plaque strongly correlated with local immune activation, implying increased inflammation in the arterial plaque, a bad thing. And the abundance and type of bacteria in the arterial plaque correlated with the type and abundance in the mouth. Simple daily tasks have been shown to cause transient bacteremia. Bacteremia is a bacterial infection in the blood. And in the healthy, the immune system clears these bacteria. But in the unhealthy, this extra oral bacterial burden can contribute to morbidity and mortality. And speaking of bugs where they don't belong, in this great study of 1,815 subjects, the effects of PPI, proton pump inhibitor use, on the fecal microbiome was analyzed. Proton pump inhibitors are pills that you usually take when your stomach's upset to reduce your stomach acid levels. The PPIs worsen the microbiome there were significant increases in genera loaded with opportunistic pathogens, bad bacteria. Additionally, the fecal microbiome analysis also showed significant increases in taxa associated with oral microbiome. The gastrointestinal microbiome is supposed to be somewhat compartmentalized. There are certain bacteria which should ideally reside only in the mouth or stomach or large intestine. When you start to see oral bacteria in the feces, it's an indication that the system is no longer self-regulating. And a bacterium which may be slightly bad in the mouth may be very bad in the large intestine, colorectal cancer being the best example of this. In the case of PPI specifically, by altering the pH of the stomach, they allow bacteria who may have otherwise not survived the acidity of normal stomach acid to pass on through, potentially causing problems downstream. Continuing on the theme of problematic oral bacteria causing problems systematically, here we look at the genus Fusobacterium and its connection to colorectal cancer. The microbiome profile for colorectal cancer is very unique among the conditions I've analyzed. There are a number of bacteria associated with colorectal cancer, but Fusobacterium is far and away the number one suspect. 
The chart shows in orange individual studies where subjects with various health conditions had significantly more Fusobacterium than healthy controls, while the green is the opposite. Clearly, this chart shows that in general, Fusobacterium is correlated with disease, and the enormous spike in CRC, colorectal cancer, is clear as compared to all other conditions. It is thought that Fusobacterium translocates to the colon either by traveling down the GI tract or through the blood. There are many oral activities such as dental surgery, scaling and cleaning at the dentist, flossing and brushing at home, and even chewing food which have all been associated with transient bacteremia, a spike in bacteria in the blood. Once Fusobacterium is in the colon, it initiates a slew of bad activities which you can learn about in my presentation on colorectal cancer in the microbiome. Perhaps you think the brain may be immune to bacterial infiltration due to what's called the blood-brain barrier. This study looked at the presence of E. coli DNA in the white and gray matter of the brains of deceased healthy controls as compared to Alzheimer's disease subjects. As you can see in figure C, in both white and gray matter, the Alzheimer's patients had significantly higher levels of E. coli DNA in their brains than did the age-matched healthy control donors. Again, we're talking systemic pro-inflammatory responses of the immune system to types and amounts of bacteria where they don't belong. From this fascinating 2020 study out of China, we have evidence which is hard to believe. These researchers were looking for another way to measure colorectal cancer risk. They decided to search for circulating bacterial DNA, as in the blood. They had 25 colorectal cancer patients and 22 healthy controls. They identified the DNA from 3,883 different bacterial species amongst all subjects. And in A and C above, you can see the number of species for each of these subjects in their bloodstream, never less than 1,000. 41% came from the GI tract, 28% were oral in origin, and 20% were from the skin, believe it or not. This shockingly illustrates how whole bacteria or parts of bacteria can make their way from a variety of origins into your blood, where your immune system is going to react, and the end result could be a number of systemic conditions that you would never associate with your gut or your mouth. Therefore, it would seem obvious to aim for a healthy microbiome and one that is less inflammatory. When addressing the microbiome, first to come to mind are conditions like IBS, SIBO, Crohn's disease, and ulcerative colitis. Of course, these are conditions of the GI tract and are obvious. What's less obvious are others like autoimmune conditions, cardiovascular disease, depression, anxiety, and many more. The average person doesn't think of these being linked to the gut health, but they are. Our earlier slides covered how whole bacteria or parts of bacteria are present in your blood, your brain, and really everywhere in your body. Here, we see the role Streptococcus can play in connective tissue autoimmune disease. There are these short sequences of amino acids called epitopes on these bacteria. Those same sequences exist in your connective tissue. So if your immune system keys in on these epitopes to get rid of the invader, there is a good chance your connective tissue will suffer by friendly fire as the immune system can't distinguish between the two. It only recognizes the epitope, regardless of the origin. As for the chart, green means health-associated data, while orange is disease-associated. As you can see, there's a lot more orange for the genus Streptococcus and its species. So how does one rectify their microbiome in an attempt to address their health concerns? For some, diet and lifestyle changes can go a long way. But for those who have been suffering for some time, who have significant dysbiosis, or what I refer to as the broken gut, diet alone will most likely not get you where you want to be. You need to drive significant environmental shift in the gut. And this is done through supplemental prebiotics and not by probiotics. Probiotics are usually comprised of species from the genera Bifidobacterium and Lactobacillus, and their quantity in these products as compared to your total microbiome is but a drop in the bucket. And Lactobacillus is generally not a good idea for adults, as you will learn in my webinars. Prebiotics are fuel for your microbiome. Yes, they're in your food, of course, but you need to consume them in properly blended and dosed supplement form to get the results you want. My protocols feed the other amazing bacteria, which are even more health-promoting than Bifidobacterium. I hope you learned a thing or two from this free presentation. It's a great example of what you'll see if you join my Microbiome University. 
I have 50 in-depth presentations on deck highlighting every conceivable topic about the microbiome. I'll launch a new Microbiome University presentation each Monday morning, and each Thursday evening, I'll have a large free group webinar for those with questions about the presentation of the week. So join now.